Perfect. Now, with that being said, at six o'clock on the dot, again, a big warm welcome officially uh, to another um, High Rise Academy Masterclass. So very, very exciting. Um, big warm welcome to you, Max, um, our special guest of the night, our co-host. Topic today is um, creating urgency, um, a topic that's extremely relevant across all stages of a sales process or sales funnel. Um, we'll probably have the biggest turnout uh, that we've ever had for a sales masterclass uh, so, or for one of our masterclasses. So speaks for the relevancy of the topic. Um, for all of you, again, use the chat. Feel free to ask us any questions. Um, I will do a quick intro of you, Max, and then I'll hand over to you. Um, we'll have an hour shop. For those of you that don't know the concept yet, we'll really stick to the hour. Um, it's supposed to be informal. It's supposed to be value added to you. So any questions that you have, please, please ask. We'll share a highlights video afterwards. Okay. Now, with that being said, a quick intro on you, Max, from what I could research. I think you've been in sales uh, for at least the last 15 uh, years. You passed through a variety of different positions. I mean, you've been a sales trainer. Um, you've been an interim manager. You've been a business coach uh, among some. But I think some of the highlight positions relevant to the audience, since it's high rise, we help career changers find a new career, is I think that you started your career and that you went through an apprenticeship in, a, in an insurance. Yes, that's right? true. Um, so technically, you're, uh, you could say some a little bit of a career changer. Um, so breaking into sales then, though it's obviously related. I think you went through the hard school of a call center. Yeah. Uh, from mm -hmm. what I saw, um, tough. Then I think you even did field sales at Vodafone before you then slowly uh, ventured into what we call tech or SaaS. I think you were at Wonderflats, uh, you were at Press Matrix, uh, just to name a few. And as business coach and sales trainer, I think you've seen lots of more companies from there on. With that being said, Max, uh, over to you. Extremely happy to have you. I'll moderate and I'll ask you some questions in between. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I can't see all of the faces, but <laughs> it's great to have you, right? Um, great to be here. And I guess um, from my side, uh, what I will do first is share my screen so we can visualize what we're talking about. And then we can take it from there. Just give me one second. All right, doing it right now. Found it. Yep, it's coming. It's coming. Give me feedback. Is it is it there already? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, now I'm being very frank at the from the get go, right? I will trick you a bit in this, uh, so don't be don't be mad at me for doing that, <laughs> all right? But um, let's start off with the agenda, all right? So. Um, we will talk about a few subjects. Why one more urgency? Uh, I mean, that's an obvious one, but just for alignment reasons, all right? Uh, and then the trick to use and why they fail, and then how real urgency works and how to create it, all right? And afterwards, we will obviously have the Q&A session, which will be a bit longer for you to really ask all the questions that you have, okay? And as uh, Dom already mentioned, uh, if you have a question in between, shoot it and it will be moderated. All right. Cool. So, uh, I mean, Dom said it already. Thank you very much for that, uh, that intro there. Um, so my name is Max. Uh, I'm in sales since 15 years, doing a lot of different things. Um, but my focus definitely is on startups, B2B and SaaS, uh, tech sales for that matter. Okay. That is done and dusted all right so why you want more urgency i want you to to think about this one for a second if you want you can obviously shoot some messages in the chat and uh i would love you dom to kind of uh, take over if you want and and shoot me one or two things that that are coming there on why you want more urgency right why you want more urgency why i mean why urgency it's obvious yeah. Um, if you're not getting any uh, feedback not yet. anything people are still being shy come on it's 6 p.m on a wednesday 
it's not a Monday. There's no excuses. So any questions that you have or any any comments, why do you want more urgency? Please share. Please share. Otherwise, um, I will just... otherwise I will I will say what I think. You know, we want more urgency. Um, and from from my side, Max, the, the, the obvious is well to close deals faster. Yeah. Or to close deals at all. For sure. For sure, right? And uh, you hear that the um I let me say people are saying the chat is deactivated. That's very, very helpful feedback. Yeah. Oh. Let, let me work on that. And while I do that, Max, please feel free to continue. Yes. So obvious, the, I mean the most obvious one, um, as you said, Dominic, is is speed, right? So what we're trying to do here is or the wish is to optimize our sales cycles and move deals faster forward, right? We want to close them earlier and not have them. And I guess I move on with the second part is really um, optimize our pipeline as well, right? So minimizing the stuck deals that we know and therefore optimize the forecasting as well. And if the chat is not on yet, then I will move on. Yeah, everyone use the Q&A function. Okay, so then the chat is deactivated for you, but the Q&A feature definitely works because that's what you used to tell me it's deactivated. So use the Q&A, we can read that, absolutely. All right, cool. So moving on <clears throat> with the third reason, which is, I guess, the, the big one, right? We want more revenue. Essentially, we want to optimize conversion rates and close more deals. I mean, that's, that's what, what it's all about at the end, right? So, um, I mean, I hope we're aligned on this one. Um, if you do have any other thoughts on that, then please share that. But otherwise, I guess we can move on to the to real things, right? The, the flesh, because I guess we're aligned on this one. So um, the tricks we use, or you use, and why they fail. I mean, I'm using that, um, those tricks, right? I used them for a long time and uh, they actually, grew um, time by time. I mean, some are obvious, some are not that obvious. Um, and if you have any tricks that you're using to create urgency, then please share them. I mean, at the end of the day, everything that we are doing is super uh, helpful. And here's a little trick or the first trick in this whole concept. Um, the things that we will talk about actually are things that, that do work, right? So we're not talking about um, the so-called BS, right? We call, talk about things that do work and you can use them. Um, however, all of what we will be um, talking about is maybe 30% of driving more urgency into your pipeline, right? So keep that in mind. That's why, that's why, we, why we named it the tricks you use and why they failed because it's only 30% of the game, right? Though they're helpful. Uh, move faster. When when I started uh, really working with pipelines for that matter, right? At the start, I was just going for everything. There wasn't even a pipeline. It was just a list and let's go, right? Um, but then when, when I started to understand um, the game of pipelines and really having the need of closing more deals and being faster with everything, I, I figured, okay, uh, I just need to call them more often. And if they say, call me back in a week, then I call you back in two days. Right, so that that was my conclusion. That uh, helps for in in most cases, really, because uh, from my experience, it's like that. Whenever somebody says, "Please call me back in three months," they don't mean three months. They just want to get you off the subject, right? They they don't want to deal with it right now. So it's super easy to just go into the call and say, "Yeah, no worries. You want want me to call back in three months? I will give you a call in one month." All right. And you can ease that off by being funny about it and saying like, hey, and if it's not ready yet, man, then it's good that we, that we had this chat, all right? And I will back off again. But it gives you more opportunities. So this is one that, that really helps. Just don't follow the path of the customer. Try to give it more of your own speed, all right? So the next one, oh, I was too fast, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, the, so the next one really, is guidance, right? In all of what we do, what we need to understand, and I had a hard time doing that, right? I really was the guy saying like, oh yeah, 
whatever you do, I'm following your speed. I'm following your guidance, right? You're the customer. So, and I'm not following you. And, uh, but what really helps is setting up follow up dates. I mean, you have, you know what I'd say, right? Always be following up. Cool, but let them know, right? I will give you a call back that in that time, that in that day. So they know, right? Give, it, give them deadlines. If you need something from your customer, give them deadlines. Really set deadlines, right? As give them to-dos. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, all of that is really expectation management. The better we're at expectation management, both sides, right? The less friction we have in our processes. So that gives it a sense of urgency, of course, and it speeds up the process, right? And then we have the, the point of trust. Now, this is a pretty big one, right? Because the more trust we have from all the stakeholders in a company, the more likely it is that they will say, yes, you can solve my problem or fulfill my need, right? Now, what, what we're doing to create trust is obviously building rapport, right? There's uh, this leading and pacing thing. I mean, you can take it to the degree of really like shadowing them and mirroring whatever they do, right? But that's not really what I mean. I mean, it's just like trying to get into the world of thinking of your customer, right? Really build that bridge, that connection on a mental and emotional um, way to, to really feel and understand where they're at, right? Because What's really important to understand is, is that whatever they do, what they tell you is like 5%. And you obviously, if somebody, you, you know that, right? Somebody is like super happy with you. And then the next day they say, oh, I'm, I really can't be bothered with this right now. Please call me back in three months or whatever, right? Actually, what they most probably are telling you, I'm in a stressful situation right now. My boss got at me or whatever, right? I can't, I'm really, I, I'm not in an emotional state. And if you build enough rapport and you have enough empathy, which is necessary to build rapport, then you will understand that and not be guided by that, but then re-guide, or as, as the guidance said, right? To really go the next step and say, hey, I'm back enough for today. I understand you're in a stressful situation right now. Let me give you a call back tomorrow, right? Everybody understands. So, and I guess what, what helps as well with building trust is uh, references, case studies, and all that good stuff, right? Um, the more trust we can build, the better off we are in all of the process, right? And really, um, I guess that is something that I really misunderstood for a long time is um, that I don't need to build trust only with one person, but with the whole company. In terms of I have more than one person that I need to talk to or that I need to understand, right? Because if I'm talking to the user, which is okay for some periods of the process, then I still need to understand that I need to build trust through that person with the actual decision maker, right? So in everything I do, I need to follow that as well and ask the person that I'm talking to, what can I do in order to present the information the way that the decision maker needs it, right? Which builds trust because if you are the star in providing information, then that builds trust as well, right? It gives confidence because you're perceived as an expert, right? Cool. Max, can we can we stop here for a second? Um, yeah. Two questions, because the things that you say uh, make a lot of sense on all levels. Now, somebody that might just have entered sales is thinking, all right, um, let, let's start with guidance, okay? Let, let's get very practical down to it. I'm just getting off a call, a discovery call. I had a good call. I have the feeling, you know, I, I nailed the pain point and there's good rapport. Um, and then I'm just new to sales. I'm an SDR. How am I giving a customer homework? You know, I think many people hesitate at what that is, just like they hesitate to name the price at some point later down the sales process and what they're shy about. But do you have an example of how do you appropriately give a deadline or build expectation management and to make sure you create that urgency or that micro commitment. Yeah, I guess um, what what really helps is to communicate it in the call already, right? Um, for instance, if you had that go call, then the next obvious step will be to discuss when 
we would chat the next time, right? It really depends on the product. But in, in some cases, like for uh, press matrix, right? We needed information on what kind of uh, um, magazines and stuff they had to uh, get an idea. And in most cases, they didn't even know because they had more than one branch, right? So I needed that information to even move the con conversation further. And they needed to gather that information, all right? Mm -hmm. So what I did was, I'm gonna give you a call in one week's time. Is that realistic that you get all that information up to that point? If yes, then I would write that in the email, which is the follow-up email, just saying, hey, it was a super nice conversation. As we discuss, we will have a next conversation on Tuesday, then at that time, right? Please prepare all the information up till then. Otherwise, we can't move forward. Perfect. Perfect. And I think what that does, right? I think translating it is you're securing micro commitments from your prospect, right? By, by you saying, is that right? Is one week's time enough time? Yes, it is. You know, it's the micro commitment and there's something like dissonance theory that people don't want to break with, right? So you, you probably increase the chances that they don't want to break with their own word, right? Psychologically. So, so understood, great. Second question is trust. And uh, people on the call may think, all right, trust, everyone talks about trust, but how in the hell do I create a level of trust when I just have two, three, four interactions with a prospect? Usually I fold up with them, I call called a couple of times, I, I move them down through my sequence, and now I have a first real call, which, which is a discovery call. How do you establish trust? Is there any any tip or is it just being empathetic, finding the right wording, the right level? How do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, I guess what you what you said at the end mm, is very true, right? Like finding the right words, being empathetic. I guess a very uh, important point is being authentic about it, um, right? Not being salesy. I guess that <laughs> that's the most important factor, right? Uh, and just communicate as as you are as a human being uh, what i always say is and that that really does it for me right um i never look at um paul the ceo of any company that i'm going to call right it's just paul you see i mean the icp is a strategic thing that we need but it's not about the sales call so i always perceive the person that i'm going, call, going to call and understand for myself hey they're wearing boxer shorts maybe right now because they're in home office, right? Or they go clubbing or they go partying. They have the bar barbecue with their family, right? So it's a regular human being. And so I, I'm going to call them as if I would be calling my best friend. Easy mm -hmm. going, right? And not pushing too hard. If somebody is giving me the information on a non-verbal level, I'm stressed right now then I can pick that up, right? And say, hey man, I'm so sorry that you're feeling stressed right now. I'll give you a call tomorrow. There's yeah. nothing better than building trust or for building trust than backing off for a second. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right? Because Great. it makes sense. If they say, I don't want to talk to you right now, there's not really the chance. But if you back yeah. off and call the next day, it's so likely that they will say, hey, this is not a super salesy person. They don't want to push me, right? It's more right. of a consultative approach and a very, very human approach about calling. And I guess that is the easy or not easy, but the quicker way instead of learning all the NLP, you know, leading and pacing stuff, right? Which is super strategic and like micromanaging your own um, way of behaving. I guess the, the better way of, of doing it is just be a human being and be friendly and, and have a laugh, right? Yeah. So it's about mindset, right? Pre-call mindset or pre-meeting mindset that you set yourself that that's a human person that wants to be treated like a human and not like a sales machine. Great. Uh, one question that, that arrived uh, is from Ron David. Thanks for sharing. Um, you said, you know, following up sooner than agreed, your very first point, move faster. Yeah. Um, and then with what you just said on building trust, what if I am afraid that I might annoy the customer? Um, that I'm following up faster than he said he needs time to, to check something up internally. Is there a danger that you can follow up too soon? No, I guess not. Because at the end of the day, look, um, there's two scenarios, right? The first one is that they tell you, let's say three months, right? And you tell them in the call, hey man, three months is cool. I'm going to give you a call in one month. 
all right? They will give you a re reaction, even if it's a bad reaction. Maybe they are super angry and say, I said three months. Okay, and then again, back off and say, hey man, I'm sorry, you know the game, I'm in sales, I just tried, man, you know? <laughs> and yep. that's it, right? So I guess everybody really understands. If you're open about it, if you're honest, if you're not salesy and you're able to back off, then again, you have more chances. And maybe, maybe if you give it a spice of humor, not everybody likes humor, but I guess like, let's say 95% of the, all the people on the planet do, right? So, um, I mean, if you give it some spice and say, hey man, I know you said three months, but you know, it's my game to sell you the product. So therefore, <laughs> let me give you a call in one month, all right? And even if you don't like me calling at that particular point, hey man, I'm just going to ask for the weather and back off again. Perfect. Great. Cool. Um, if there is no questions right now, let's move on to the next point. Perfect. All right. FOMO. We all love it, man. Fear of missing out. Now, <laughs> I guess this is something that really can work and it, it, it's super helpful um, to commu communicate any cost of waiting that you can put into numbers or limited pr project capacity. Now, let's be frank, right? For most products, we don't really have a limited project capacity, right? But what we can do is kind of work around it. As I always say, we're not lying. Never ever we do lie in sales, right? Because it's falling on our feet because the real goal is second money, as you know, right? Upselling, cool. But you can only do that if you have enough trust. So therefore never ever lie, please. But what you can do is bend the reality a bit, right? So, I mean, if you say, hey, you know, we only have like, I don't know, 10 people in the onboarding team and we're like, everybody's wanting to buy our product right now. So what I can offer you, I have like three sl sl slots left for the onboarding right now or within the next week, otherwise, looking at the timetable it might be in like two or three months probably right depending on the situation but that's what i'm looking at right now so mm -hmm. i mean that is one way of doing it it really really depends on the product on the situation but just to give you one example what i did um when i when i was at wunderflats for for instance right onboarding them onto the platform yeah but we have to do it right now right mm -hmm. So, but like I said, really, really depends on the situation. But if you can find anything that gives you the chance of limiting the project capacity or communicating some cost of waiting, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's, a, a, I work with one company and they said to their customers, hey, you know what? I'm not giving any discounts at all, ever, right? But let me tell you this. In two months time, our prices will go up. Why? because we have an investor round, right? Let's be frank about it. And therefore we need to boost our revenue. That's why we will go up in prices. If you want the good price that we have right now, then you should mm -hmm. go move forward right now. Mm -hmm. But again, that's all tricking a bit, right? And it's not doing a full job. Just mm -hmm. to repeat myself from the get go, right? Uh, Max, one, one question that came from uh, Katerina, thanks for sharing as a trick she uses uh, to create urgency is something like FOMO, right? Coming around with limited offer and, and, and a strict deadline. Um, so on deals that you want to move fast, you need to close ASAP, there's something like, hey, only valid through tonight or you know through tomorrow or Wednesday. What do you think of that? Well, I guess there's, um, there's this gap between and I guess all of the, or a lot of um, salespeople actually do that, right? Hey, I give you this offer, but it's only limited. If you don't close the deal with me in the next two days, then it's, you don't get the good price, right? Now, the problem here is that we all know, and the customer knows that in most cases, let's say 99%, that's a flaw. Because if the customer doesn't buy within, let's say two, three days, but comes back after seven days and say, now I'm now I decided I want to have the product. You surely, if the customer say, can I still get the price? You surely would say yes, right? And the customer knows as well. 
So I guess if you have uh, the power within you to say two days and after that it's gone and then after that it's really gone, then yes. Yep. That, I think that's the key point, over. right? Yeah, exactly. You need to be you need to be willing to follow through on that one, right? So otherwise, you probably lose credibility uh, in the face of that customer. So uh, it it doesn't have to be gone drastically, but it, at least it needs to be different, right? So that you say, hey, again, back to trust. I can trust that person's word, and when they say limited offer, then it really is a limited offer. Yeah. Yeah. At, at least saying no, right? Once. Um, to that and then saying hey man but you know what i really like you let, let me go to my ceo and see what i can do right perfect that's a fair, fair one but if you do it then really be hard on it great cool i hope that answered the question to a degree yeah i think it did all right uh only for you i love that one um whenever you create a personal commitment especially in a later or um late stages right in the closing phases um just like i mentioned let me go to my ceo for you all right usually no but i will do everything to make this work for you um mind you right we're losing revenue if we give you a discount but let me try but if i go up to my ceo and tell him you're interested but only with that price man then you have to sign otherwise i'm losing my face right so that is like interpersonal stress that you raise in there. And you create that personal commitment on an emotional level, right? Like I, if you have that stage of trust, that building relationship, right? That, all that good stuff, then the person will not want to harm you, right? But then again, there's so many things going on around it that whatever you do, you could fall into the trap of, hey, my trick is working, but it's not working for mm -hmm. several reasons that we will talk about in a minute, all right? Mm -hmm. But it could work. So negotiate, right? I mean, cool, we already spoke, have spoken about it, but it's obviously one point, right? Discounts feature higher tier plans, whatever it is, only as a now deal, right? Or in five days, could also be now, but, right? Really be strict about it but we discussed that one already. And the last one is um, implying urgency, right? So use psychology, using words like now or urgent today, limited, only, whatever it is, right? So playing, playing around the psychology of people there a bit as well, uh, it could help as well. Obviously there's more to it. There's other things that you're doing, other things that, that I'm doing, that Dominic is doing, right? There's a lot of things that you can do. Those are the predominant ones. I guess those are the ones that you will see in almost every single sales team on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Something or some, some can like mix of that will be found there. Right. Now I said, I will trick you. And the trick is that 30%. Let's look at the actual 70% or in some cases, even more. And before we go to that, um, right? How real urgency works and how to create it. Um, I have two thoughts. The first one is I want to give you, give you a, a scenario that I had at Press Matrix and I was really fresh to the game. Then maybe I was in two weeks, right? And I had my leads and I was calling all of them up and stuff. And then there was one big company and I didn't even know that there is a super, super big company. But what I've seen was the history, right? So the deal was lost I guess like 10 times already by different sellers, right? So I gave him a call and I really had a super good chat and it was not, I was not super great in the call. The person was just open-minded enough to talk to me. And I gathered a lot of information and through all that that I gathered and all the, of the process that I had with that one customer, I learned a lot. The, the game changer for me really was that that call or the process with that customer because they bought. They bought after 10, 10 people tried to call them, I called them, and it was just a connection different, right? I didn't do really anything different, but the connection was different. And I learned a lot from that, how urgency at the end works because the customer, because he liked me, guided me 
through a process that I didn't know before in that to that degree, right? So it was a present from the customer to me, um, maybe because the customer really started to understand why he should shift to the product, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But then again, I really thought about it and it made sense to me afterwards what happened there, right? And the very first thing that happened there was this, a proper full-on and a bit different discovery. Because now look, um, from my experience, it's like this. In most sales teams, discovery goes like this. We start with a situational question, right? Do you have, I don't know, uh, a digital booking format or whatever, right? And I say, no. Oh yeah, that's cool, I'm gonna pitch, right? Now, in some cases, we even ask two or three situational questions to measure like, is the situation suiting whatever we need in order to be able to sell the product? But then we pitch, bam, right? Now, that's good as well, but some, some sales teams go the next step, right? Ask, after that, they ask pain questions. All right, now I understood your situation, in which way is that affecting uh, you, right? What kind of trouble do you have with your current situation, whatever it is, right? Okay, cool. Uh, and then they pitch, which is good as well and much better than pitching after situational questions, right? But what we can do is out of that pain questions, combine a form of potential impact that we can see as sellers, right? For the customers, for the better. So what is the impact that betters the world of the business that the person is in and the personal bit situation of the person in the business because people are not only interested in their business but also in themselves especially if they're not the business owner right so i guess that is really what we're trying to look for and all that situational questions help us to understand the situation then we ask pain questions to understand maybe they have a problem or do they even have the perception of i have a problem and if not then this is something that we need to guide them through, right? And mm -hmm. only then, if the impact is aligned, like what could be different if, right? Or what are you wishing for? What kind of impact would be great for you, right? In that subject, only then we can move forward to the pitch, all right? And now uh, with the pitch, and I'm not talking about like the cold call initial pitch, the 30 seconds elevator, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about after discovery, now I have discovered that this product could be suitable to you. Now I'm going to really start selling the product, right? And that's so, so important because what I perceive in, uh, and what I did wrong for, for a long time was having the pitch, like the elevator pitch, right? Just ready in stock right and i'm gonna i identified the customer could be a, a good fit now i'm gonna pitch and it's the same pitch all, all over again but we need to after we did the discovery individualize our pitch and really really individualize right because if we individualize the person in that pitch the person will say hey that's me that's my situation crazy and the most easy way to really have that connection of you're selling something and you really mean me with your product and references, trust, right? You already helped somebody that is like me. And that's what, I'm, uh, what I mean with human-centered storytelling, all right? So once you did your discovery, what you can do, it's just an, an example, right? What you can do is summarize and say, hey, okay, I understood this and this and this and this for alignment reasons, right? And say, you know what? It's funny because I was talking to John the other day and John was in exactly the same situation. And then you can go like with a lot of colors and explain, right? And be funny about it and really say a few things next to the product about John. Like, you know what? John was a golfer. It doesn't have really have to do anything with the product, but it gives it a more natural and human feeling about the story and about John. It makes John a human being, okay? And then John obviously sits in the same chair. So they need to have the same, the same position, right? So people mm -hmm. can align with the story and with the person behind it. So it's not the story about, hey, business A, 
right? And we help business A, that's cool. And we can put that into the story, but we need to talk about a person, right? People only connect in stories really on an emotional level if it is about a other, another person. And most likely they will connect if it's a person like them, mm -hmm. right? So we need to have that human-centered storytelling. And then with that, and that's a cool part, what we can do in that storytelling is talk about the situation. We know their situation, so we can repeat that, right? Then we can talk about, and that's super important, about the problem. We can repeat that in John's story, right? And then we can talk about, and the that's the most important point about discovery, talk about the impact. And then talk about the future that John had now, right? What is the difference now working with us for John? And then you can go back and say, hey man, imagine you would be in John's shoes, right? In which way would you feel different? In which way would your work life be different? In which way would that impact your business, your personal life, whatever it is, right? I mean, in which way would that be different if you would be experiencing the same things as John? And they already connect to John because they're, John is was in the same situation. So they can start to connect to the story of the impact, the final bright future that you're yeah. offering. Okay. So I guess, that is something that really really helps and by the way um, and i guess that is super important as well what we tend to forget is that discovery is not the discovery call it is obviously part of it and it's a big chunk but we need to discover and rediscover all the time right because the business shifts especially i mean we're all startups in most cases right we know how fast paced that environment is and that counts for customers as well. So if our sales cycle is, let's say, six months, a lot of things change in the meantime, right? So we need to keep that in mind and always uh, rediscover and say, hey, man, is that still true? Is that still the way we, we want to go? Is there maybe a different team lead? Do you have a new CSO? Whatever is going on, right? You need to take that into consideration and always like ask the customer, is that still true? What has changed, right? It gives you the chance to really oversee their situation and what's really going on. And you don't fall into the trap of, oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Right now the deal, I was so sure I would get the deal, but now something changed, right? Try to gather that information over and over again. And everything you call like, hey man, last time we spoke, you told me da, 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 da. Is that so true? Alignment, right? Very important. And then you can pitch alongside. Um, okay, and the last one, and I guess this is really, really important because most deals in uh, from from my experience get stuck for the qualification reasons. And I'm not talking about the pre-qualifications uh, in, in terms of, all right, they need to fulfill A and B. And if they're not A and B, then we can't sell the product to them, all right? So let's say we can't sell a HR tech to them if they don't have any employees. I don't, I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about the qualification in a multi-dimensional way, which basically means uh, like Medic, right? I don't know if you, you know Medic, but most uh, sales teams, especially SDRs, use Bond. That's like the most common one. I'm not the biggest friend of Bond, really, especially in early stages, because budget, um, we had like two conversations. How could we talk about budget? But that's my personal view, right? However, qualification is something that also um follows the, the whole pipeline right you don't do it once you do it over and over again but if you have a deeper qualification method like medic what you will start to do is not only understand like need or like budget or whatever or time you will understand like is this the person the person i'm talking to is that the person signing the contract which is important but there also could be not not the person signing the contract but the decision maker or they're not neither of, of those right? But they really love the product and they need the product for their team. So they would push it into the company. Then they're called the champion, for instance, right? Um, and there's different like types of persons within companies that you could qualify and understand who is that person and who else do I need to talk to, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe what's their buying criteria? Like, do they have criteria? Does a company needs to have a certain... I was talking to, for instance, with a company, and they said, if you are not having X amount of revenue, um, right, per year, then we're not talking to you. 
because for us it, it was Panini, I guess, right? Super big company, and they said, "Oh well, it's startups. We're not working with startups, right?" So look at their decision criteria. Try to understand that. Maybe maybe they have like a, a buying center. That really is not helping with any kind of urgency. But if you know that, then you can at least like try to have an impact on that to any degree. But if you don't know and you believe the person is signing the contract, but they're not signing the contract because there's a buying center, you're missing that, that opportunity of maybe even calling the buying center saying, hey, did you get that? Do you have any further questions? Do you need anything else from me, right? So I guess that is so, so important to understand the whole game and really go deep into how they operate, what is important to them, who else needs to be talked to. And this is something really, really important. If there's more than one person deciding the game, talk to all of them. Talk to the peers, talk, I don't know, talk to their friends, right? The more people you call in a company, the better it is. Everybody's saying to me, oh, well, you know, they will get mad, I don't know, like, pissed off if I can say that right because you could talk to all of them well I mean it's your job really to like network into the company right and for me if somebody's saying to me yeah well I have to talk to the boss I'm saying okay cool what's exactly the name of your boss oh got it cool right and then I'm talking to, talking to the boss no one will be ever angry for me talking to the boss unless they said I want to talk to them directly right it's a bit of a trick situation but you can maneuver around it and it's better off having the direct chat, right? Even because you don't want to take the, the food off the plate from the person that you're actually talking to. But what you can do is talk to the boss and just for a second say, hey man, you know what? I was talking to Mark, Mark, your colleague, right? What a good guy. Wow, I'm talking to him about this and his product and I just wanted to give you the feedback. Hey, this is a super nice colleague you have. Cool. I hope my, my email finds you well. Uh, shall I put you uh, CC? Mm -hmm. Simple. But they heard your name. They kind of have a good feeling about you. And you're allowed to send the email CC. So it goes directly to the leader as well. So, Max, just to making sure that you know, I heard it right. So, in other words, the key to creating urgency lies in discovery, right? And doing a good, deep discovery. Or in other words, if deals fall through or a prospect is ghosting you, I think it happened to all of us, uh, it probably is because you didn't do your job good enough during discovery, right? That, that some triggers um, that you thought you understood, you, you obviously didn't understand because otherwise the prospect would have felt the urgency organically, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and part of it is qualification because... Um, I guess for a lot of deals that I thought would happen and didn't happen, and I took a, it took a long time for me to realize that I just didn't qualify good enough as well, right? Because I was talking to somebody I believed to be a decision maker, but wasn't, and then I didn't got objections, hmm. but I got pretext. Yeah. Right? And we it's, always it's... perceive objections as pretext, but they're not in most cases. Yeah, that's perfect. And I mean, that's a whole different masterclass, right? And as with anything, right? Most errors happen in, in discovery phase, right? Let's call it the discovery phase, uh, which is the most important. Now, I think especially more, more junior people to sales. Um, well, let's look at how discovery calls, the first real meaningful interaction, right, that you have, how they come about. You either schedule it yourself through a very quick interaction, be it a cold call, LinkedIn, email, or you've been scheduled that interaction mm -hmm. and the prospect may not even remember anymore. What was the company again? You know, um, Especially when it's too much time between the first interaction and the call. And I think many feel the urge of, I first need to give something and then they immediately maneuver themselves into that pitching situation You know, versus leading with questions, which can also create value. But do you have maybe a hint or two for people listening? How then do you do that in discovery? You know, where the prospect is expecting to receive first, you know, how do you create the trust with just asking questions or do you quickly say again what you do and then you move to questions? What, what is your own take on moving into discovery? I guess for me, um, yes, we need to set a baseline of like, what will we be doing, right? Expectation management. 
Now we're in this call. This is our subject. This is why we, why we have this conversation, right? What I'm trying to do is understand your situation, right? What we need to do is get a mutual understanding. I will give you all the information about the product that will show you the, I'll give you a demo, whatever it is. But first of all, I want to understand your situation, how you feel about it, what you actually need, right? Because otherwise, if you do not match the criteria, then I can't sell you anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I guess that is, that is something that I prime, right? At the start of, of a demo call of a discovery in, in order to get the ball right. I want to get information in this because otherwise it's not sensible to really give you information because it needs to suit you really, mm -hmm. right? Which is a fair say and everybody understands that. People are thankful for that as well because it really means, hey, you're respectful towards me, yep. right? Yep. And also with that comes, and I love that that one session in the in the High Rise Academy about the 10, 80, 10, right? Um, and that's really, really it. I mean, just start off like saying a few words about why, you, why you're having this call and maybe give a, a reminder on your product. And then you go into just asking, ask, don't tell. Don't sell the product. It's not the job in a discovery call. The job is to gather information yep. in order to then, let's go back to the slide, right? In order to then individualize your value proposition to the situation, the pain and the potential impact of those singular customers. And I think, Max, between us, I think that's where mastery in sales happens and where you see the difference between somebody just starting and, and somebody that's been in there because... Uh, I think the prospect can only perceive value from being led through the conversation by the way you ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you do that in the right way, if you only hammer them with three, four, five, six situational questions that don't add value, they're easily annoyed. They say, hey, you scheduled a meeting with me. What is it? You could have researched that online. You know, so I think it's about the right kind of questions that ideally lead to them saying, Oh, yeah, wait a minute, that's, that's true what you're saying, right? But then you, you immediately get to the challenger sale. Just want, let, let's see what you think about that one, Max. Personal experience, okay? Yeah, please. Because uh, I've been there also with teams, um, also now at High Rise. How do you get into discovery comfortably as a relatively junior person, but still having established trust so the other person gives you the time of day in listening and answering your questions? And what we do is uh, after we establish the agenda while we're in the call, we create context by telling a story quickly, a minute, saying, so dear customer, let's say it's a SaaS company. You know, we work with, you know, we just last week, I talked to, as you said, Michael, also a head of sales. If I talk to head of sales at SaaS company, ABC, then had the problem of, didn't find enough salespeople, onboarding was difficult, didn't have the resources. And here's what we helped him do, just quickly. And that is exactly where high rise comes in. That is the use cases that we have. Does that make sense to you? Um, you know, can you, can you relate to that and just openly? And then usually they see the relevance for, oh yeah, I am that person, I'm in that, I'm in that situation. It was quick, right, 30 seconds. And then they get the, let's say the permission to enter into discovery and really take the time of day to deep dive into it without having to pitch again. Yeah. No? What do you think about that one? Uh, I like that approach, right? I mean, creating context is super important. Um, and then next to that, obviously, if you have a story prepared, a short one that brings that context, that is super. Even though um, if you repitch later with all the information, you can then really nail mm -hmm. that it's really really them in the, yep. in the story right so i guess but but a pre-story is super good to like get the ball rolling uh, and really make them understand why we're having a call at least give them the context yep. right perfect S super I, I love that approach yeah yep. great cool um i guess we're kind of done with the with the uh call wow. So I'm, I'm really looking for, for all the crazy and, and uh, super bright questions. 
Um, because I guess um, the, the format, as, as Dominic uh, explained to me, is really living from, from that interaction yeah. and, and the Q&A. Absolutely. So any questions that you have, all right? I mean, we've said a whole mouthful now on qualification and you may think, wait, I thought that's a masterclass on creating urgency. But yeah, I think that's the secret, right? It, 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 errors happen during discovery and you not having either established report, having found the impact and not having created the urgency because of that or not having qualified correctly. That's why deals follow through or fall through and uh, not follow through. Um, so any questions that you have, please, please share, hammer them at us. Anything that comes to your mind. One question that came um, a little earlier, Max, it's not completely related. I want, want to ask you because I promised it to Isa. Yeah. Um, so, so earlier, last slide, okay? You said, you know, be human. Humor comes a long way. Great. Then the question that came is, well, humor works great in the US or in the UK, but in Dach or Germany, really? Can, does humor go a long way? How do you do that without coming across forced? Yeah. Uh, look, I guess there's there's two things about it, right? I mean, there's something called uh, cultural differences, okay? Obviously, uh, we have to call differently in, in the US than in Japan, right? But Western countries, as we are in Dach and obviously US as well, right? They kind of have the tendency to be somewhat alike, right? Now, Germany or the Dach region itself is perceived to be like kind of, you know, wearing the tie and everything, but that's not that true anymore. I mean, obviously if you calling the, the chairman of Siemens, it might be true, but come on guys, not everybody is calling that person, right? So <laughs> I guess, I guess uh, at the end of the day, it makes you uh, vulnerable as well, right? If you have humor, if you are human about it. I mean, if you force the joke and you're not a funny person and you don't even want to do the joke, you're just super professional about it and that's your way to go, then rather do that than be try to force you to be funny about it, right? But then again, remind yourself, you would most probably be talking differently if you would be calling your best friend. You would be calling and saying, hey man, what's going on? How's the weather, man? Right. Instead of saying, hello, Mr. So-and-so, I'm calling from the company so-and-so. Now we want to talk about the subject, right? No, just give him a human call and say, hey, what's going on, right? And I guess in some cases, and I would give it a percentage of like, let's say 10%, right? In 10% of the cases when I'm calling, right? I'm calling and saying, hey, my name is, it's a cold call, right? My name is so-and-so, I'm calling from the company. How's the weather? Or how are you doing? What's up, right? And sometimes they answer like, why are you asking? Or what do you want, right? So this might be something or exactly that, what, what you're kind of afraid of, right? Yeah. But then I say, oh, well, I'm telling you right away. I'm look, calling you because of da, 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 da. Why? Because they gave me the information of, I don't really have time. I'm stressed. I'm not into like conversations like that. Cool, right? I take that as inform information and then I move on. But I move on in their pace. If they don't want to do the jokes, if they don't want to ask, have the question of like, right? Then I just maneuver to whatever they like because it's not about me, right? But I like to be happy in the calls. And 90% of the people that, are, that I'm talking to as well, and it really lightens up the, all the conversations from the get-go. The very first conversations are so more natural and so much mm -hmm. nicer, right? Even if they say, no, 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 I don't want it. It's in a more nice and, and, and friendly way. And it makes my job easier because life is easier if you just settle off with people, right? Totally, totally. Plus it needs to happen in the context that you are, right? You, in your authenticity as a person, everyone might live humor differently, right? So yeah. be authentic about the way you're humorous, yeah? Exactly. Um, cool, perfect. Then another question that came very early. Now is the right time to ask. Um, urgency, something you create or something you uncover? Mm -hmm. um, I guess looking at, at everything that we covered, it is 30% something that you can create, right? And 70% something that you uncover. Because let's be frank, if the person discovery doesn't really 
have the situation or is in a situation that they really need the product or want the product or whatever, there's no chance, right? So you need to uncover that need, that wish, that whatever, okay? And then you need to address or connect your product to whatever you'd uncovered with the right pitch, individualize, right? Otherwise they won't understand how you can help them on an individual level. And then the last part is uncover their metrics for making the decision because otherwise the decision most probably won't be made. Mm -hmm. So it's, I guess, a game of 70% uncovering stuff and matching whatever you do to the individual situation and the tricks that we use and why they fail, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. You know, I've, I've read on LinkedIn, uh, um, interesting trend that some companies now are, are mixing or considering mixing to move to, to quicken up the sales process, the discovery call with the demo, you know, when you instantly find a pain point and you feel, man, that person, you know, would benefit from that product, you instantly show them so that you save the next touch point and you shorten the sales cycle. What do you think of that? Or do you think, ah, oh, no, a quick a proper discovery needs to take proper time? Yeah. Uh, wow. I'm, uh, I'm going to get hate for this one. But look, I'm, <laughs> my position is like this. Uh, if you are able to pre-qualify at least the scenario that they're in, in order to understand is that maybe a scenario where we could help, right? In the first call, super. But you don't need a full-on discovery call really depends on the product i had um companies that have like 40 questions mm -hmm. that they need to understand first in order to even move forward with uh, anything right so but if you're not in that specific scenario then i would say yes match it right do do both i mean what you can do i wouldn't split it for the matter of splitting it right i would connect it and have that discovery call and I mean, they're blocked time of their calendar anyway. So if there's time left, then go for the product. But I wouldn't go for it. I mean, because my per personal opinion is uh, that most product demos are way too long, are way too detailed, right? But if you do it like right after the discovery and it's part of it, it's so super fresh what the person is talk has been talking about that you can connect whatever they said to certain points of the product. Mm -hmm. right so you don't show all of the product in every single shiny button yeah. you show exactly whatever exactly. they have been talking about their certain use case in that scenario yep. right and then you can still add hey man we have so much more to offer right and i always say like hey man we have 20 200 uh, of the shiny buttons i can show you all of them right uh if you want that let's have another chat right let's do another meeting for that um but please tell me are we at the point of go moving forward or do you want to see like the whole product and never ever somebody said i want to see the whole product yeah ever one time ever somebody said i want to see every single button right now right <laughs> because they obviously understand that there's more to it and they have the onboarding phase and they have to learn the product and so forth right but they need to know the value and the value needs to be individualized so for that matter, and it makes life easier for you because you don't have to remember it or write a super long history. Yeah. Uh, do it in the discovery. Perfect. Yeah. Last question, Max. Please answer shortly. Okay. Right. Also forces you to think about that one shortly. And because we have one minute left, uh, have you ever made a big mistake trying to create urgency? Maybe in the earlier days. And what was it? Yeah. Uh, more than one time, right? pushing for the deal whatever you do if you go salesy on it and say hey you have to really sign the deal now and we need it and whatever right every time you get really hard pushy and there's no pull anymore yeah. then you, lo you lose the game because then people back off because they perceive you as a pusher and lose their trust so this is something for for some years i guess uh are really the wrong because I had the internal urgency of, I need that deal. And I forced that onto my customer. I guess that's the biggest mistake I made whenever I push too hard and lose that pull that the customer is still like having a feeling of, and hey, we have the dance, then I'm losing the deal, man. 
Perfect, because I think that makes sense for you, but maybe not for the customer, right? And one thing, uh, if you do your discovery well, ideally find out what we call trigger events, right? Or so what do they need your solution for? Is there a deadline because they need to fill a position because they need a project in place because otherwise they don't get their raise. And if you know their deadline, you can create urgency also by saying, hey, if I understood you correctly, you need it in place by X because you need it for Y. If that's still the case, please let me know. Then we need to re remove the roadblock now. That makes sense for them. That may create urgency, right, by, by experience. But that summarizes, I think, well from what I take away. Max, thanks a lot. Uh, the key lies in discovery and qualification, right? Only if you really uncover the levers on impact on the business and personal level on what your solution might mean to them, what their current status quo means to them, then you really only know potential blockers that might come up and things that need to be in place for the deal to come through. Yeah, and, and on that matter, Thanks so much. Really enjoyed talking to you, Max. Uh, we'll share um, the slides, question mark. Yeah. If, you, if you're open to them, um, Max, then please let me know. Then I'll share it with this round of attendees. Um, we'll also share the highlights video um, to all of you as part of our alumni network. You have access to the full masterclass afterwards on High Rise Plus. So thanks a lot, uh, all of you, for tuning in, for taking that hour out of your night. Hope you all have a nip you know like a like a nugget or two to take away uh to implement and again thanks to you special guest max really enjoyed it and i'm sure we'll see you around again thank you ever so much for having me i hope i could give you one or two bits of value thank you perfect thank you, thank you. bye bye bye